Well, it's finally happened. We have a net date for Starship Flight 2. SpaceX has tweeted that they expect to fly Starship for the second time, net, that's no earlier than November 17th. Of course, pending regulatory approval. They installed the flight termination system. So, kind of a big deal. Plus, there's everything else that's been going on at the site. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Brilliant. Let's start our journey through Starbase this week at the production site, and specifically the Rocket Garden, which remains a busy place, but it's not always about things getting stored or worked on here. Sometimes it's about things getting destroyed. The long-standing air separation unit currently at the Sanchez site is being demolished, with crews taking cutting torches to its structure. Parts of this system have already been dismantled and trucked off, and this tower is one of the last pieces to go. It would appear that SpaceX has scrapped this project, Literally. Of course, the plan had been to generate some commodities for Starship on-site at the Sanchez lot, things like nitrogen or locks, but at least for now, that's no more, and everything will continue to be trucked in. Remember the collective outcry from nerds everywhere when we found out that SN15 wasn't going to be preserved for history, but instead it was destined to be scrapped? Well, it appears that SpaceX has heard our cries, as Ship 15's aft section, which had been hanging around the Sanchez lot, was moved and put on display for all to see. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. It, it's, I mean, it was moved, but it's not on display, and surely it will be scrapped soon. Now let's move across Remedios Avenue over to the production site, specifically the Mega Bays, where we can see that further work has been done on both of them. The scaffolding on the original Mega Bay is almost gone, as SpaceX has finally started to remove it over the last few weeks. The roof of the new Mega Bay is being assembled, and it seems like we'll soon see at least its exterior structure completed. Next door to that, over at the Star Factory, this week has been about adding cladding to the walls on the taller nose cone assembly portion of the building. Many wall panels have been going up since the start of this week, and it also seems that SpaceX is nearing structural completion of this part of the building, as evidenced by the fact that one of our cameras is now very much blocked by the building. Of all the originally constructed structures at Starbase, the one remaining has been Tent 3, also known as the Nose Cone Tent, and it's waiting until this part of the Star Factory building is complete to be demolished itself. This week, Tent 3 had a fresh new nose cone moved outside of it. This nose cone is labeled NC-36 and should be the cone we see used on Ship 33. Back over at the Sanchez lot next to the Rocket Garden, the Ship Thrust Simulator also made an appearance this week. Crews were performing work on its hydraulic rams. These are what push on the ship aft dome to mimic the forces of Raptor engine's thrust. It appears to just be some standard repair work, or maybe these are upgrades to support changes that have been made on upcoming vehicles. Either way, only time will tell. Unfortunately, we do have some more unpleasant news for photographers and anyone that just wants to see what SpaceX is up to, aside from the Star Factory building occluding one of our camera views. This time, it's at the launch site. Yes, we've been talking about it for a few weeks now, and it is the wall that's going up next to the suborbital site, and the fact that it's continuing to grow. Sadly, this wall will prevent some views into both the suborbital and orbital launch sites during testing, and from our perspective, we really hope it doesn't go much higher. Now, it's not a huge deal in terms of visibility at the overall site, but this particular angle at one time was a really nice view of the full stack on the orbital launch mount, but that's just the way she goes. SpaceX crews continued to work on this wall on Tuesday and throughout the rest of the week with a lot of effort. Shout out to Gene, Space Padre Isle on Twitter, who made a cameo on one of this week's daily videos, on horseback no less. We also got to enjoy a bit of a dance party from one of the wall segments of the new wall as it was caught in the wind during a lift. However, thankfully, nobody got harmed, so it's all good. Wait, what? They're, they're de-stacking the Ship QD just disconnected. Why? No! Leave it connected! Leave it stacked! It looks way cooler that way! Ugh. Next up, let's talk about the full stack that we have again, even if it's about to go away soon. Before we do that though, let's talk about this week's sponsor, Brilliant. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I just found the perfect thread related to it on the NASA Spaceflight L2 forums. Hang on, let me just log in. Um, and... Oh no, I've been hacked by the Ares 1X fan club! Not happy with the spooky scale I see from that Starbase video recently, huh? But how? 
Well, it turns out today's video sponsor, Brilliant.org, might have the answer. Just one of their thousands of lessons on different math, science, and computer topics happens to be about passwords. It's a fantastic interactive lesson about how passwords are stored, why some passwords are stronger than others, and why my old password, aka the successful number of flights of Aries, was not a good idea. So yeah, I'm never using the password one-ish again. Well, don't forget at least to create a strong password when you sign up for Brilliant at brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or by clicking the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Well, now it turns out I also have to change the password on my luggage, so I'll send it back to you. All right, moving over now here to the launch site. This week on Monday, the dance floor and the new net underneath it on the orbital launch mount were both still present. This would, of course, prevent a flight because it wouldn't be smart to fire your engines into either of those things, right? But I guess if they did, you could say that Super Heavy has the hottest moves on the dance floor. I, Adrian wrote that, not me. I take no responsibility. On Tuesday night, the chopsticks were lowered slightly around Ship 25. It's unclear what the exact purpose of this was, but Sometimes they just get adjusted to give access to otherwise hard to reach areas. Before this move, the right chopstick was also wiggled, which could have just been a bit of fine tuning. Next up, for the chopstick fans out there, more chopstick movement. They moved up again and just a bit over on the day Tuesday. Then they moved into what looked like the lifting position. The LR11000 crane was then moved to the suborbital launch site. This could also be in preparation for a launch as SpaceX would not park a very expensive crane next to a launching Starship. And we saw this exact same thing on Starship's first fully integrated test flight. Then, some more tiles on Ship 25 were replaced and repaired by a SpaceX worker. Remember, the timeline SpaceX posted on their website confirms they are trying for a re-entry with Ship 25, so should the ship reach that point, these tiles would be pretty important to protect it during the re-entry phase as it approaches Hawaii. Then on Wednesday, that net and dance floor underneath the orbital launch mount were removed and it appeared that we were getting really close to go time for launch. At this point in the week, it was still super uncertain when the first launch attempt would be based on the still missing paperwork from the FAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service. There was some speculation that approval for launch was imminent and based on how fast things started moving, it did appear as if SpaceX thought they might get approval as well. This is partly because of what happened next, and that was crews installing the all-important explosive charges for the flight termination system. One of the last things we typically see before a final stack and launch. On Wednesday, a crew of workers went to the explosives container next to the orbital launch site and collected the charges that will be installed on the ship and booster. Again, this is one of the last operational steps before getting the stack ready for flight, so excitement from here on out was high. These crews then moved to both ship and booster, and in an installation process that was over 10 hours long, placed the charges in the FTS boxes on the vehicle. We cannot 100% confirm if the pins were pulled, but we got some great shots where you can see the charges, the pins, and all of the other bits and bobs of the flight termination system as the crews worked on them. You can even see the small red remove before flight tags on the pins. As a reminder, the FTS was significantly beefed up between flight one and flight two, as SpaceX did not properly detonate the ship and booster during the in-flight anomaly on flight one. Once the FTS destructors, as they're labeled, were installed, Teams then departed the FTS boxes, but not before they closed them up and sealed the whole thing up with speed tape, which is basically just fancy aerospace grade duct tape. Again, we cannot confirm or deny if the FTS was fully armed with pins pulled, and only the future will tell. However, if crews don't return to this area again, we can safely say it was probably armed. Thursday began with the laying down of the LR11000 crane at the suborbital launch site. Again, this same thing happened before the first flight of Starship, and it certainly sparked some hope that this was in preparation for Flight 2. Then, late at night, the flight symbol was projected onto the clouds by the FAA to signal that... Ah, uh, no, it's, it's just the new spotlights that SpaceX installed for night lifts. Really cool shot here from Sean, though. Then it was time for what we had hoped would be the final lift, although... With the orbital pad clear klaxon going off behind me right now and the ship QD detached, I think we can safely say that they are about to destack this vehicle. But I'm just going to continue reading the script as written because thanks, SpaceX. Thanks to that new spotlight I mentioned a moment ago, we got some tremendous nighttime views inside the Raptor engine bay of Ship 25 as the limelight hit it from below. The ship then rotated, moved over, and was placed on top of the booster. And shortly after, the ship QD connected to pressurize the ship for additional stability. However, 
As I mentioned in my various rants that you may or may not have seen, because the editor may or may not have cut them out, there were indications that this was not in fact the final stack. And one of those indications was the appearance of the hot stage ring stand and the load spreader used to lift it off the booster moved back to the launch site that night. Also, during the day on Saturday, the LR11000 crane's jib was, as you can see, once again lifted back up. And of course, now I can hear the orbital pad clear klaxon going off behind me, and the ship QD has been detached. So I think it's safe to say that we're about to see a D-stack. And by the time you watch this, who knows? Maybe it's been stacked again. Maybe it's still D-stacked. Maybe they're gonna take the FTS out and put it back on and play hot potato with it. I don't know, but either way, this stack, not the final one. Ultimately though, don't fret. Installation of the hot stage ring isn't a time consuming task. And as we talked about earlier, SpaceX has gotten super fast at ship stacking as well. So this could very well be just a temporary thing. So at this point, you're probably asking, what's going on, especially on the regulatory side? And the answer is, we simply don't know. As of the writing of this video, the launch license is still not approved with the FAA and Fish and Wildlife. NSF reached out to both and they confirmed no updates as of this moment in time. However, SpaceX looks confident in the launch date this week on Friday, as like we said at the top of the video, they tweeted that pending regulatory approval, they're targeting no earlier than November 17th for launch. Although with that tweet's pending regulatory approval remark and the current D-stack about to happen, I can see it slipping to Monday the 20th pretty easily. Really quick though, I do want to point out that we have Christmas merch. Hey, and it looks awesome. It's actually knitted, so it's a real sweater, and we have multiple designs, including Starbase, we have Crew Dragon, and we have a sweet Raptor Engine Christmas tree design. Now, these are actually knitted. Once again, they are knitted, and they are cozy and warm. In fact, when they arrived in Texas, Das, Sean, and I all just put it on and lounged around the house in them, because they're just that comfortable. This cold front could not have come at a better time for the arrival of this merch. Make sure you head on over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and order by November 20th to ensure delivery by Christmas. While all the stacks and de-stacks and all the regulatory issues are certainly frustrating, it's a huge deal that we finally have a no earlier than date from SpaceX. This seemingly signals that SpaceX thinks that regulatory approval could be right around the corner. And certainly this is the closest that we have ever been to Starship Flight 2. So the excitement is in the air and with any luck, Hopefully soon Starship will be. And not just for the D-Stack that they're about to do. I'm hopeful the launch license will be released early in the week for a launch attempt on Friday the 17th. Maybe it'll come out by the time you watch this. Or maybe it won't and they'll launch on Monday the 20th. But either way, until we hear from the FAA, all bets are off. No matter what, we will be there with marathon coverage as always. So watch out for our stream to go live in the hours before launch. All right, that's it for this week. As always, thanks for watching and don't forget, be excellent to each other and also buy merch buy the merch it's really good merch come on it's really it's, it's just look at it it's really good merch it's ridiculously good it's probably my favorite merch